God, for your tender mercy. Thank you for that you've kept us all day long. God, you protect us from the hand of the enemy. Therefore, we are grateful. My God, tonight as we get back into your word, we pray that you would speak to us, Father, tonight in a clear and concise manner. We bless you and give you glory in Jesus' name. We do pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Woo! As always, pray you had a good day today. Amen. Amen. If you didn't, you know my style. It's getting ready to get better. Glory to God. We're going back to our favorite scripture. Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians the 5th chapter. Want to revisit verse number 22. As you know, we have been dealing with the attributes of the Spirit or the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. And I believe by the Spirit of God that as we understand these attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, and as we embrace these attributes, that God can get better glory out of our lives. Amen. Because what it's going to do is bring about a tangible change that you can see. How many of you understand that there's always someone watching you? And the funny part is, there's always somebody who knew you when. Yes. And it is the attributes that are a part of the fruit of the Spirit that not only changes us from the inside, but it also helps develop us from the outside. Jesus said, like Jesus, Jesus said to let your light, come on, also shine that men might see your good work and glorify the Father. And what he's simply saying is, is that something on the inside of us should be uh, exemplified on the outside that men can just that men can see. Now this is important because there are a whole lot of folks who are claiming to be Christians. I'll say it again. There are a whole lot of folks claiming to be Christians. On this planet, planet there are over 7 billion people on this planet. And uh, they say that a third of them are Christians. Okay. How many of you know that everybody, just because you say you are a Christian, does not mean you are saved? Amen. Just like being in your car, don't, uh, your garage does not make you a car. Right. And so, just, I learned that just because people claim to be Christians, does not mean that they are Christians. Because the Bible said, Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. And so it is our job to make sure that because we are Christians and because we are God's children, that we should be exemplifying the essence of who God is. Isn't that right? Amen. And God is in the fifth chapter of verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now it's ironic that we come back on the first uh, first uh, Wednesday night of the new year and we are dealing with faith. Come on class, say faith. Also, just what happened, we dealt with on Sunday, the power of faith. And so tonight I want to revisit this uh, attribute of the fruit of the Spirit and it's right in the middle of all the attributes. And tonight we're going to deal with faith. Come on, class, say faith. faith. Now understand, one of the major uh, enemies to our faith, you all, is the enemy's ability to convince us the impossibility of the things that we are hoping for. The enemy works overtime to convince us that the things we are hoping for the things we are praying for, the things we are believing for, he is working overtime to convince us that it is impossible to attain. And so what he does is he uses circumstances, he uses situations to create uh, roadblocks in our lives, if you will, to make us, to convince us that God is not going to do what we are asking him to do. And so, 
It is our job to not fall into the trick of the enemy based on what we see. The Bible said the just shall live, come on class, by, by faith. And so if you and I then are going to live by faith, then it's simply suggesting that we cannot be moved by a situation. Are you following your name? Because if you and I begin to be governed by our senses and governed and, and, and you can't judge God's love for you and God's commitment to you based on what you're dealing with. Because here's, my, here's the, the reality. All of us are going to go through something in our life. Amen. Job said, a man born of a woman is of a few days and they are filled with, come on class, trouble. And so God wants to make sure that we knew that over the course of your life, God is saying, don't judge me by what you're going through. Yeah. How many folks understand that you, you can use your faith to get through whatever you're going through? Amen. Come on, say, use my faith use to my get faith. through yeah. my go-through. Go through. You and I must learn to use our faith to get through it. Because here's our reality. There's something that God may not change in your life on your time frame. I'll say it again. There are some things in our life that God may not change on our time frame. Uh, today I was looking at a clip from uh, Bishop Patterson. And he was giving his testimony of how he was attacked by the enemy. And he told them that uh, he waited two years before he told his church that he was attacked with prostate cancer. And his testimony was, Pastor March, he says, he says, he says, I feel like I feel like the Apostle Paul. He says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, now I know you all want me to stay here. He said, I want to stay here. But if I die, I'm still going to see Jesus. Oh, and he said, now I'm going to believe God with you all to stay here as long as I can. My point is this. A few years from the time he gave that testimony to his church, he died. Now, his death, catch this now, his death does not change the power of God. His death does not alter how faith works in the life of the believer. Because what the enemy would do is to cause us to look at someone else's life and see that, well, they had faith, they believed God, and it didn't work for them, and I guess it's not going to work for me. But understand, that's not how God wants us to govern our faith. Faith in God says, I'm going to believe and hold on to God, watch this, to the point of death. Are you hearing me? In other words, even if I got to die believing, then bless God, I'm going to die believing. I'm going to die believing. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. The Bible talks about Abraham, oh, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, said there were some who died in the faith, never having received the promise. But watch this, they received it in their hearts. Right. Are you following me? Yes. And they saw in the spirit realm what they did not see in the natural. Yes. Are you following me? In other words, when God promised Israel to, to bless Israel, God promised it to Abraham, but Abraham didn't see it. Right? Who saw it? Joseph saw it. Are you following me? But Abraham had to receive it and embrace it as his so that his faith could pave the way, watch this now, for the next generation. Are you following me? And so, Pastor, is that to say that my faith can't get me healed or can't get me what I believe for? No, no. You keep on believing for what God has promised you. Because when God, listen, when God has made you a particular promise for your lifetime, then that means you have to live to see it, the promise God promised you in the lifetime. Are you following me? Amen. And so, go to Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. Hebrews 11 chapter. Look at verse number 1. A very familiar passage. I'm sure we all know it, but I want you to look at it for a minute. And kind of lay your eyes on it. The writer of Hebrews 11 and 1 says this. He says, now faith, watch this class. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now watch this. He said, faith is the substance of the things I'm hoping for. Let me ask you, how many of you all are hoping for something from God? Amen. How many of you all have positioned your life 
in a place of believing that God is going to give you a breakthrough in certain areas of your life. Amen. And so it's good to have hope. In other words, if you have no hope, break this down, where there is no hope, there is no expectation. Where there is no hope, there is no expectation. How can you say you are expecting something when you have no hope for it? One of the reasons you go to, you go to your job and work 9 to 5 and put in 40 hours of the week is because on Friday you are in expectation of a paycheck. Amen. If you're not, bless God, I am. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. You don't do what you do without an expectation of something at the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. Faith says, faith is the substance or the main ingredient of the things that I have my expectation tied up in. My hope and expectation is tied up in my faith because I am believing that God is going to bring to pass the thing in my life that I believe based on his word, he says, is from me. But watch it now. The same faith, though, is the evidence. Come on, class, the evidence. Yeah. That same faith, then, Sister Ned, is the evidence or the positive proof of the thing that I don't see what is now with my senses. Amen. In other words, if I only rely on what I see, then that's not real faith. Faith says I have to be able to see what is not seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is why I often encourage you all to meditate in the Word of God. Put a finger there and go over to Joshua chapter 1. Look at verse number 8. Joshua chapter number 1. Look at verse number 8, if you will. That's Joshua number 1, verse number 8. Here it is. Moses had just died. And God is now using Joshua to take this next generation of people to the promised land. But now Joshua has a problem. Because Joshua was born with the other slaves, but the people here he's dealing with now, they were born in slavery, and watch this, all they know is bondage. It is hard, how many fought on it? It's hard to bring people who are born in bondage and bring them to a place of freedom. It's like our president, President Obama. There's a group of children who, who only know a African-American president. Eight years, well, from eight, eight years and down, all they know is President Obama. Yeah. And so when President Trump gets in, they can be like, oh. <laughs> oh, you mean they have other color presidents? Because all they know is President Obama. Now, those of us who are old heads, we've seen, we've seen them come and we've seen them go. We've seen them black, we've seen them white, we've seen some who are white but a black man's attitude. We've seen them all. Come on, y'all. Come on, Bill Clinton. He's a black man, a white man's body. Group with that guy. Amen. And don't send me no letters either. I ain't playing with y'all. And so, we've seen it all. And so, Joshua now has to take these group of slaves who were born in slavery, all they know is slaves, and tell them that God is going to give them the land that he promised to Moses. The problem is, they don't want to go. Some folk love being in bondage. This is why you don't want to ever get used to being in bondage. As a matter of fact, look at the person by and say, don't get used to being in bondage. Listen, don't get used to being sick. Don't get used to being poor. Don't get used to the bus. Come on. Don't get, listen, you get, don't get used to where you are. Always look from the, the road to see where God wants to take you. Amen. Now, are you in Joshua 1, verse number 8? Amen. Let's read verse number 8. Are you there, class? Yeah. Come on, ready, read. This book of the law, come on. Depart. Come on. Meditate therein, come on. Uh huh. Observe to do all. Come on. For then, wait a minute, hold it. For what? For then thou shalt do what? Make 
make thy way prosperous. Now, look at me. God says to meditate in the word day and night. Come on, cousin, say day and night. Day and night. Question, why would God tell Joshua to meditate in the word day and night? When you see, listen, when you spend time with anything long enough, that thing becomes a part of your regiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. If you read a thing long enough, you begin to see what the person who wrote it is saying. All right. Let me see if I can say it like this. <clears throat> I'm almost getting to ask this question. How many of y'all have ever had a love letter, at least one in your lifetime? Amen. At least one. Yes. <laughs> now watch this. <laughs> Ella Green said he wrote something. <laughs> I'm going to ask. <laughs> but watch this. How many of you, when you read the love letter, you could almost hear the person's voice who wrote the letter? Because as you read the letter, you imagine them saying the same words they had on paper, saying it them in your ear or face to face. Well, God said, Joshua, meditate in my word day and night. He said, because as you meditate in my word day and night, watch this, what you read that I say will paint a picture in your mind. Amen. See, what the devil cannot do is take what's going on in your head from you. <laughs> Y'all missed yes. that. I said what he cannot do is take from you what's in your head. Yes. Pastor, why is that? Have you noticed? That's why he always put things before you. He put this in front of you. And put that in front of you. And put that in front of you. To want to change your perspective. Yeah. But when you meditate in God's word day and night. And get that word. Watch this. Move it from your head to your heart. Mm -hmm. Now that thing becomes embedded in your heart. And now because it's in your heart. There's an image in your head. I'm going to ask you all if you were hungry. But imagine having your favorite dinner. Fried chicken, <laughs> macaroni and cheese, some greens, some cornbread, a nice cold bottle of water. Yeah, y'all want Pepsi and Kool-Aid. Water. Water good for you. Now watch this. As I was naming those things, how many of y'all could almost see it in your mind? Well, I'm sorry, I left one out. Candy yam. I go with that dog. And some nice German chocolate cake. Huh? Yeah. Y'all, excuse me. Get my shot. Hey! But watch this. If you think about it long enough, you can almost see it. Now watch this now. An image, watch this, an image creates a desire. I'll say it again. An image creates a desire. An image creates a desire. Now, Pastor, where in the world did that come from? They spend millions of dollars on advertising on a TV you watch. And they'll show it over and over and over again. You know why? Because they will spend a billion dollars because if enough folks see it, watch this, it will create an appetite. I remember one time, bless God, I had just finished eating and I saw a KFC commercial. Pastor Martha had hot wings. Mind you, I was already full. Tell me, bless God, I'm like, boy, them wings don't look good. I mean, they, you know, you, you, you know, what you see on TV is never like what's in the box. But I'm telling you, they had the stage just right. And then, my, 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 my whole mouth of water, I'm like, mm. <laughs> Trying to figure out if I can convince somebody to go to the store. And give me eight wings. One eight. <laughs> go with the girl. And so watch this. They understand that whatever is before you will give you an image. Once that image is there, that image then creates a desire. Once you then have that desire, it will now propel you to take action to get what's in your mind. Are you following me? Now, go back to Hebrews 11. Are you trying to outfence up Joshua chapter 1, verse 8? He says, once you meditate in the word day and night, 
He says, your prosperity is tied to what you meditate on. Your prosperity is tied to what you meditate on. Now, if you don't meditate on anything, you don't give God anything to give you a desire for. Which means, if you don't want nothing, then why should God give you anything? Are you hearing me? Now, I'm going to read for you in the NIV version. It says, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Now listen, that's a big shot right there. Because assurance says, I already have it. Come on, Pastor, they already have it. Some of you all have what's called direct deposits. If you know you work all week or, or those two weeks or that month, how do you get paid? If you know you put the work in and you have direct deposit, you don't have to go to the bank and ask the tailor, uh, did my money hit yet? Because I have the money sent directly there, I know it's there even if I don't see it. And so what we do is we'll write a check on money we haven't seen. I'm sorry. You pull out your debit card and say, put it on here. Now, you don't know whether the money got there or not. You are hope well, and, 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 and let some of y'all use Chase and have it tap to your phone. Mm -hmm. Y'all going, yes, Lord. Right, right. But see, other uh, than that, though, you don't know because you haven't seen it. Now, you write a check on money your eyes have not seen, your hands have not touched, but because they told you it was there, you go into the store and you write a check, watch this now, with a confidence in knowing that this check isn't going to bounce. You know, anybody, <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord, I'm going to stop you. Anybody ever been in the store and had somebody who want to check that they know bad? Or pull a credit card out and say, here, listen, it said what? It was canceled. You know what? Maybe I ain't paid. Here, try this. <laughs> All the cards. <laughs> glory to God. Ain't none of them cost no good, glory to God. But watch this. Faith, watch this now. Your faith check. Never runs out. When your faith account is always loaded, whatever it is that you need, whenever you activate your faith, it pays the bill that you're trying to get from God. Amen. Are you hearing me? Your faith says it's already done because I believe based on the promises of God that I have now what God said I have a right to. Come on, Pastor, I live. By the, faith by the faith and the finished works, the finished works of, Jesus. of Jesus. Write this down. My faith is the game changer. My faith is the game changer. My faith is the game changer. Pastor, what do you mean my faith is the game changer? They had a song back out in the 80s that says, when everything else fails. My faith is a game changer. When the doctor can't give me any hope, my faith is a game changer. They said they are the money. My faith is a game changer. Are you following me? When your body is saying one thing, my faith, my faith in God must say something different. Are you hearing me? Because the moment you line your mouth up with your situation, you have just come into agreement with it. And so I cannot then allow what I see to override what my faith is saying. Because if I allow what I'm looking at to carry more weight than my faith, I'll be, I will always be looking at what I'm looking at. But if I want to change it, let me see if I can say it like this. 
in the game of baseball, they have what's called a pinch hitter. Can you imagine in the bottom of the ninth, two outs, bases loaded. You're down three runs. They bring in a pinch hitter. The pinch hitter is generally a guy who always makes contact with the ball. And so you bring in your best pinch hitter who has enough power to put the ball in play up over the fence. And generally, if he makes contact the right way, the ball goes out the park and you win the game. Now, you can either say the pitcher made a bad pitch or the manager brought the right guy in at the right time and this guy was the game changer. Let me see if I can go like, like this. How many of y'all uh, recall, um, uh, what's his name, Reggie Jackson? They called him Mr. October. I don't care if he didn't do squat all season. In October, the man will hit 7, 8, 10, 12 home runs in the playoff in the World Series. So they didn't call him Reggie, they called him Mr. October. Because if the Yankees ever got to the playoff, they understood that this man was going to produce. Okay, maybe y'all know him. I don't know Michael Jordan. You don't care how down you were in the fourth quarter. As long as Mike can walk, he's the game changer. You can call that one game the ball was sick, he had the flu. Scored 56 points. About to die. He says, yeah, give me, give me the ball. Sure, give me the ball. Game changer. Well, that's what your faith is. Who cares what you're facing? Faith is the game changer. Come on, because say faith is the game changer. In other words, I'm saying that like this. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. This is funny here. Faith does not play by the rules. Faith does not play by the rules. A terminal illness says it's going to kill you. Faith says no. I can stop that. Come on. Poverty says I'm going to get evicted and get put out of my house. Faith says I ain't going nowhere. And if they put me out of here, there's one a door open on the other side of the street. Are you hearing me? Faith says if somebody walk off and leave you, faith says God will put somebody else in that spot to take up the boy. Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. Come on, say, my faith, my faith is a game changer. Yes. Go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. 1 John chapter number 5, look at verse number 14. Why are you turning it? Write this down. Your confidence must be in whatever God has told you. Your confidence must be in whatever God has told you. Your confidence, my confidence, must be in whatever God has told me. Pastor, why is that important? Mr. Hanson, I can't use my faith for your word. Just because God gave you a word does not mean that same word apply to me. Why you hear me? Because God may give you one way or one avenue and says, well, like Naaman, God told, had the prophet tell Naaman to go dip. Well, God may not tell you to go dip in the pool or in Lake Michigan. You might freeze. Come on, they froze to death. Well, I'm trying to follow the Bible. No, God told Naaman to do that. Are you hearing me? You must let your faith be governed by what God told you. Now, how many of you understand that when you read the Word of God, the, the Word of God will give a witness in your spirit when God says, this is for you. Right? 1 John 5, look at verse number 14. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to, come on class, His will, His will He does what? Now, look at me. It says, our confidence is if we ask anything that's in line with his will. Yes. Question. I wonder how many things we're asking God for that's not in his will. Because sometimes folks get mad at God because God didn't give them what they wanted. And God says, that's not in my will for you. 
to be told, there are some things you ought to be glad God didn't give you that you asked for. Come on, don't raise your hand, but anybody, anybody ever desire something at one point in your life? And then down the road, the same thing you saw, you saw it again and go, oh dear God, thank you Lord. That you, come on, bring your class and say, oh, and they go, hey girl, you're like, who are you? Where's the day? You're like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Look at what I've been stuck with. <laughs> and so, and so, there's something that God does not give you. <laughs> oh, oh, don't play. <laughs> we all do kind of fall. I'm gonna say this here. <laughs> Pastor Mark, I would call them at my reunion. <laughs> anyway, she could be watching tonight. I'm gonna leave her alone. And I was like, thank you, Lord. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> And so, confidence for you and I is if we're asking God for the thing that's in his will for our lives. When we know that it's God's will for us to have it, you stay right there on it because you know that God wants you to have it. Here's our problem, y'all. Sometimes we get up and move way too fast. We move because God doesn't operate by our timetable. Somebody say, I must remain persistent with my faith. Come on, say, I must remain persistent in my faith. Pastor, why is that? Because sometimes your symptoms will be talking louder to you than the evidence of God wanting to give it to you. And you know it's hard to hang on and believe God for some money when you you have a, you have nothing that says I can buy nothing. Your debit card don't work. Your check don't bounce, and you can't find a friend to loan you nothing. But God said, "I'm gonna bless you." Come on. Well, let's use Joseph. You know, and I know, it was hard. It could have been hard for Joseph to maintain his faith in what God told him, especially when he was already thrown in a pit. Come on. And then got thrown in Papa's house. And then this cougar going to accuse him of going after him. Huh. <laughs> now, come on. How was white with trying to say, come on, Joseph. Come on, JoJo. Oh, Joey. The Bible said, Joseph got it. He ran out of his coat. And she's like, oh, uh, you want to hear you want to you want to you want to you know me? Power of fire! Power of fire, look at him. He tried to take, and the boy ended up in jail. Now you know he had to be firm in what he believed that God told him. Because it's easy to give up when there is no evidence of what God said will happen in your life is there. But my confidence, Ella Green, is not in what I see. My confidence is in what God said. And as long as I know what God says, then however long it takes, I'm going to stick with it. Come on, let's stick with it. Verse, 4, uh, verse 15. It says, and if we know that he hears us. Well, you can shout right there. It says, and if we know he hears us. Which means that when you are telling God what he says, God is, break it down, God is always attentive to what he said. God is always attentive to what he says. This is why God says, put me in remembrance of my word. Because if you can't tell me what I said, maybe you said something I didn't say. You recall in Genesis, when the serpent came to Eve, she said, now come on, did God say you eat it or touch it? And she was so gullible, yeah, that's exactly what he said. Name what God said. He said, don't eat it. He never mentioned, don't touch. Are you following me? And so, you and I then must understand that God is attentive to his word. As long as I'm telling him what he said, 
He is obligated, Elder Green, to do what he said to me. Amen. Oh, yes. Are you hearing me? It says, and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. Y'all wait a minute now. I just, I just see something now. Wait a minute. And if we know he hears us, I'm going to back up one. He is hearing what we've asked according to his will. Right? right? Yeah. So then, whatever we ask according to his will, we know that we have it. Which means then, watch this, y'all. Watch this. His word creates a desire. His word creates the desire. So now, when I asked him according to his will, that gave me the desire. Now I thought I was going to honor his word. Because the word that he said gave me the desire. Isn't it just like God to want to give you something? But then he put it before you when I carry for a horse. He says, ask for this. Ask for it. Ask for it. Ask for it. And now you see it. Say, Lord, I want a case. I want a leather case, Lord, for my glasses. And God says, good. Because I want to give to you all the time. See, you think that you came up with it. God said, no, I put it in front of you. Right. See, when God gives you his word, God says, I'm going to put my word in front of you. Right. And it is my word in front of you on a carrot to a horse. I'm going to make you chase it, make you ask for it. So when you ask for it, I can now legally give it to you, a thing you already desire. Yeah. 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 That's good, Pastor. And you follow me. Yeah. And so, who does that? Who does that? Who does that? God says, I want to give it to you anyway. But watch this. The avenue is to ask, seek, and knock. Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall come. Find, knock, and the door shall be open. But God says, I know what you need. So what I'm going to do is make you ask me for it. You know how we do our kids? Or used to? Especially now since they're grown now. Kids come in there and just take your stuff. Anybody have a kid just come and take your stuff? You know what? One of the, one of the worst things apparently was, was to have my son foot grow and be same as my, as my foot. Here we go in my closet and just take my boots. Now, you know, I don't buy no cheap boots. Here we go in there and get my good boots, put his foot in my boots, wear them. And say, uh, hey, daddy, can I, I wear these? And now he got them on. And now, do I break his heart and say no? Or do I say, ask for them first? Now, watch this now. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is something violent. And the violent do what? Uh, take it by force. He didn't take it, he just kind of stepped into his inheritance. He said, I know it, it belongs today. But what this my birthright says, by, by birth, whatever belongs to him belongs to me. Right. And so, my, what this, my daddy would never buy anything to hurt me. And so, if he bought it and it's in the house, I have access to it. Right. Watch this. God ordered it. Jesus paid for it. The Holy Ghost right. has it. He right. said, you ask for it. All right, That's good. All right. And when you step over to your inheritance, something just because God said it's available. All right. Some of them step over into it. Step now watch this. Over in Mark chapter 5. And I'm almost there. Over in Mark chapter 5 is the story of the girl with the issue of blood. Mm -hmm. Now, what got me you all in this text, and this is going to be a shocker to you, there's nowhere in the text that suggests remotely this girl was saved. There's nowhere in the text that even suggests the girl was even a born-again believer. Of course, Jesus had 
died yet. But there was nowhere in the Bible where it says she was a follower of Jesus. But this girl, watch this, activated some principles of faith that brought her to the place to receive the things she hoped for. Now, Hebrews said faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Romans 12, 3 says, God has given every man the measure of faith. Now watch this. Having faith never said, I got to be a Christian to have faith. All right. All right. All right. Now, it helps. Somebody said it helps. It helps. But if God has given every man the measure of faith, then this woman here is included in the measure of faith. Right? right? Now, so then, this girl had to operate some principles to bring to pass the thing she desired in her heart. Now, keep your finger over in Mark 5. Go to the book, to the, uh, book of Psalm, Psalm 10, verse 17. Psalm 10, verse 17. Are you there? Psalm 10, verse 17. It says, watch this, y'all. This guy right here. It says, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Ooh, y'all get ready to shout. Somebody come up and hold my mule. Come on. It says, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. Now, this girl in Mark chapter 5, this girl, no doubt you all, had a spirit of humiliation in her heart. No doubt at some point she had asked God to do a miracle in her life. Right? Now, the Bible says that she heard she said, and she did. Right now, come on, say she heard. She, heard. she, said, she said, and she did. This girl, she embraced what she heard. One of the reasons Christians, their faith is not activated is because they don't embrace what they hear. Isn't it amazing how church folks come to church and they hear the word but never embrace the word? If the word of God is not mixed with faith, according to the book of James, it promises you nothing. This girl, she had to embrace what she heard. And watch this now. She had to allow what she was believing for to come out of her mouth. Somebody said, I must allow what I am believing for to flow out of my mouth. Watch this. What using your mouth does is help you hear what you are saying about it. The Bible says in Proverbs, the power of death and life is in your tongue. And so when you say what God says out of your mouth, watch this. Your ears get to hear what you're saying. It's almost like being in praise and worship. See, you can worship on the inner man, but you can't praise in silence. You can't. Watch this. Praise is an outward expression of what's going on on the inside. And so while I can worship in my heart, I can't praise in my heart. Praise must be expressed. So what you're believing for in your heart should be expressed out of your mouth. You know why? Because watch this. You believe most of the time what you say. And so you must get your mouth or your, or your, your ears lined up with your mouth so it, so it can move from your head to your heart. Why David said that word that I hear in my head. Oh, he didn't say his head? He said the word is hid in my heart. And so when you mutter or meditate on God's word, the word meditate 
need to mutter or to say out loud softly. I say it over and I say it over and I say it over again. Why? Until I'm convinced that this thing is really for me. Okay? So John, get that one. I'm going to come right in your, your lap right now. Don't raise your hand, but any of y'all ever fell in love with the person that you thought you fell in love with? And it's because you said it enough times you thought you were in love? And you realize that's not a role. I really ain't in love. That's my flesh acting a fool. Brother Queen, you just said it. See, <laughs> I don't want you. <laughs> but but <laughs> I'm going here. But see, you I I put to say I love you, you almost feel compelled to say, hey, I love you back. They go, I love you. You go. I love you too, boo. But 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 after the one thousand time, you kind of say maybe a little ugly joke would do kind of good to me, you know, a little fun of the joke. Big old ears and big old head. Yeah, right. You see, and what you say starts getting to your heart, and you find yourself in a situation that wasn't right, but because you said it enough times, you kind of convinced yourself. I guess I do like. It. And then down the road, you'd be like, boy, I fool myself at that. And so, faith says, when I say it enough, I convince me that that is real. Because watch this, y'all, the devil, watch this, the devil really is your biggest enemy. Your biggest enemy is you. Your biggest enemy is you. Come on, class, say enemy. Now, go real slow and say enemy. You are your biggest problem right there. You. It's like folk in your, it's like spiritual warfare. Folk in your, that being, yeah, Pastor, I'm going to spiritual warfare. Saying, saying, Jesus, 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 a billion times, that ain't warfare. You're going to make yourself tired, your mouth going to get dry, you're going to grow a foamy beard. That ain't warfare. Real spiritual warfare is keeping your flesh under subjection. Your biggest fight is you. Yes, Amen, somebody. Amen. And so this girl had to embrace what she heard, had to say out of her mouth what she wanted to see, and then respond according to her belief. Are you there? This girl, the Bible said, she heard that Jesus was coming through. Amen. Question class, what do you think she heard? I'm sure she heard about, she heard what he preached. He preached the kingdom of heaven. He preached the principle of God. I'm sure she heard about all the miracles that Jesus had performed. And now the miracle worker who was over there in Galilee is now coming in my town. And so he's going to do now, since he's coming, listen, I believe if he can do it over there, he can do it over here. And so, based on her belief, she said, he ain't got to pray for me if I can just touch his clothes. Because the girl understood, see, she understood that the same glory that's on him, the residue would rest in what he wore. Now, don't miss this, no doubt this girl may have understood the old covenant. And if she understood Malachi, Malachi prophesied that the Messiah would come with healing in his wings. Now, the wings, you all, in the Hebrew are the tassels of the, the priest's garment. And those were called the wings. And so the Bible said that you would know the Messiah because he would come with healing in his wings. And so, watch this now. She did not say, if I can get to him, and he touched me, I'll be healed. Her faith said, if healing Elohim is in his wings, then why let him touch me? All I want is the wings. Y'all missed that. All I want is the wings. If the healing is here, I don't need your hand. What I need is the wing. She said, if I can touch. But the him. Of his God. 
He don't have to put his hands on me. He ain't got to prophesy. How are you going to eat a bowl? Or get, get, let me get to the wings. Amen. Now, the Bible says, in the original text, that he said it over and over and over again. Watch this now until she convinced herself. Pastor, how do you know that she convinced herself? Number one, the girl could have been killed for being outside. She had an issue, and according to the Mosaic law, if you are have, have, have an issue, you must be first declared clean by a priest. Number two, whatever you touched was now unclean, and had to wait seven days to be purified again by the priest. Number three, if you ever touched a rabbi, that was infant death right there. And so, because she said it long enough, she said, you know what? I'm going all in. I'm going all in. If they kill me, they kill me. But I'm going all in. That's how you know. Because the Bible says she pressed to the crowd. Knowing what her outcome could have been, she pressed anyway. This is why I said earlier, it don't matter what the doctors say could be. I'm going to stay in faith until there's no more breath in my body. Because for the believer, you all, it's a win-win anyway. If God heals me, I win. If I die, I'm going to see Jesus. Come on. Now, now, you know, anybody ever been excited about seeing your favorite, your favorite boo? I thought I you. Come on. Anybody, <laughs> anybody ever had somebody you just couldn't wait to see? I mean, I waited all day long. I mean, you couldn't wait to see him. I mean, all morning, you had him on your mind, on your mind. Couldn't even eat lunch. Had him on your mind, on your mind. Clocked out 10 minutes early because you had him on your mind, on your mind. Ran the stop signs and broke all the laws because you had him on your mind, on your mind. This girl said, you know what? I don't care what the law says. I don't care what they can do to me. Because all I want to do is touch the hem of his garment. Now watch this. The Bible said when she touched Jesus, he stopped on his tracks. He said, who touched me? Now, notice now, Pastor Marsh, he didn't touch her. And, and one of them old blessed God preachers said, come on, Lord, stop playing. All these four touching you. He said, no, no, somebody touch me for real. Because when they touch me, something left me. And, you know, oh, Lord, I can't fit in church, can I? But that, it's different than being touched and being touched. Give my hope. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, stand down a little wrecking ball. Hey! <laughs> Where'd she go? Where'd she go? She got ran. <laughs> she go, I love that pastor. <laughs> but watch this. When you embrace the word of God, watch this down. The word of God that you embrace will demand a response from you. The word of God that you embrace will demand a response from you. The Bible says, so then faith coming by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so if you need a healing in your body, what you need is a word of faith on healing. If your money is funny and tell your strange, the thing you want to hear is a word of faith on money. Are you hearing me? Amen. If your mind jacked up, what you need to hear is a word of faith on peace of mind. Amen. Are you following me? And so we must embrace the word that, that we hear, say out loud what we want to see based on God's word, and then respond according to how we believe. Because if there is no response, watch this now. If there is no response, then your lack of response tells God, I don't believe what you said. 
Let me see if I come back down the road. I go all the parents be here before. Have you ever told your, your children, if you do X, Y, Z, I'm going to get you? And the child did it anyway. Well, that means that they don't believe that you would get them. Why? Based on what you did or did not do. Well, when you don't respond to God based on what God has given you to do, when you don't respond, God says, I can't move until you do what I told you to do. You see, some folks say, God, give me, give me the third instruction. God says, I've given you step one. And I cannot give you step two and three until you're done, number one. And so you have a lot of Christians you know, who are still at the starting gate. Because yes, God told you where he's taking you, but he can't move. Because you won't move. Now, Pastor, now why is that? Well, look at Moses. God told Moses, listen, listen, when the, the cloud moves, you move. And so I'm going to send you fire by night to keep you warm. Y'all sleep. But in the daytime, when the cloud goes and moving, don't be still asleep. Get up and go. And some put the cloud bang on. Come on, Lord, let's show how to be here. And because you didn't move. Are you following me? Somebody says, time to move, time to move. See, what the devil you all wants to do is set you up for failure based on what you see. This girl could have looked at her situation and says, no, I can't go out. I'm going to stay at home. It's obvious that she was already spent 12 years going from place to place to place to place, to person to person to person to person, spending money after money after money. Now she broke. Mm -hmm. But watch this. <coughs> she just told him, he says, he says, thy faith has made you whole. All right. Now, here's the part I want you to see. Her faith did more than just bring her healing. Wholeness means that everything that was lost was restored. Amen. This girl got her dignity back. All the money she lost, she got back. She got her respect back. She was able to go back to her family now. Everything she lost over those 12 years, she got it right back. How many of you know that faith will help to get it all back? Amen. Come on, because it's my faith. We help to get it all back. Write this down. Yeah, I'll stop right here, I think. Write this down. You can't allow your position to be changed by your condition. You can't allow your position to be changed by your condition. You can't allow your position to be changed by your condition. The Bible says over Corinthians, it says, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding. That word abounding needs to be always making progress. Come on, Pastor, say making progress. Faith shall always be propelling you to the next level. The Bible says that you're from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Your faith shall always be taking your life in progression, not digression. Are you hearing me? Your faith should never be going backwards. Faith is a progressive faith. Come on, let's say progressive faith. Progressive. Your faith should always be moving forward and moving up. Watch this. Look at me. Moving forward, moving up. Moving forward, moving up. Moving forward, moving up. Moving forward, moving up. That's what faith does for the believer. Always progressing and always going higher. Because God wants to take us or move into the place where eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Move into the place where it has not entered the heart of men, the thing God has prepared for us. And my time is all gone. Give, give this a hand, praise really come on.
man. 